We are back on the Falcons Audible presented by at and I'm Derek Rackley. I'm joined by Dave Archer, and we are one person less in the studio, but we got him, what do they call it, Arch, via satellite? Yeah. yeah. DJ so- Shockley is joining us. He is uh, in his suite, in his penthouse suite in Houston, Texas, whoa. because, whoa, isn't that whoa. right? Your, your penthouse whoa, whoa, suite? Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> that is way too much. Right? I am nowhere near in a penthouse suite. I just have a regular hotel room. Now, if I could have traveled with one of you guys, absolutely. I could have been on the rooftop right now. All right, so DJ with his Fox responsibilities is in Houston, Texas, of course, going to be covering the Atlanta Braves, Braves and the Houston Astros. Game one of the World Series tonight, but he is going to talk a little Atlanta Falcons via satellite as we talked about. So let's go ahead before I get the guys' comments. Let's talk about what we've got going on today. As always, we're going to start with a quick hitter, and it's going to be what's the temperature of the Falcons. We'll move from there and talk a little bit more about Kyle Pitts because another monster game. Do the Falcons have that rare rookie on their hands so far? And are the Falcons clutch? We've seen them close out a couple of performances, even though that was one of the issues early on in the season. We'll talk a little bit about playoffs because we know as fans, as people that are watching the Atlanta Falcons that got a vested interest, you want to know, is there a chance for the Falcons to get into the postseason? We'll dive playoffs. into Playoffs. Playoffs. <laughs> we will look ahead a little bit, and then we will talk one issue outside of the, the – um, Atlanta Falcons, but it might have something to do with the division in Deshaun Watson. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So before we get started with everything else, I want to bring DJ in because I want to make sure that even though he's a long ways away, he's feeling connected. So DJ, you're going to start us (laughs) off with your temperature of the Atlanta Falcons right now. So give us some kind of headline or temperature after what you saw on Sunday down in Miami, the Falcons evening up their record at three and three. What's your temperature on this current team right now? All right, so you guys can imagine quotation marks at the end right here. It's birds creating a culture. And I love it because you look at what's happening right now with this team, and you're looking at how they're winning these ball games, how it's coming down to the end, and how this team is starting to play at a different level. When you think about some of these players in this ball game just last week, guys starting to come into their own, starting to, to create the culture, the physicality that Arthur Smith wants them to play with. And you think about, I remember one specific play in the ball game, Cal Pitts, I know you guys remember this. He drives up, he has a guy jamming him up at the line of scrimmage, but he fights through the jam and then releases, catches the football, gets the first down. Uh, Fabian Monroe got tried a couple times in the ball game, down on the in the end zone, had a really good pass breakup these guys are fighting these guys are creating the culture that you want when you turn the film on and watch the falcons this is what you want to see when teams turn on the film you want to see a team that's not going to give up they're going to fight you for four quarters regardless of what the score is and they're going to play you hard and physical so i think they are starting to create that culture that arthur smith you know obviously has talked about since day one but you're starting to see it come to fruition in these ball games and the way they're finishing So, DJ, we talked a lot early on in the season about Arthur Smith trying to kind of feel out his personnel and try to figure out where he's going. It seems like DJ's saying that the guys are kind of trying – they're settling in as well into their roles, and they're now getting back to competing. Dave, what's kind of your headline or opinion that you have about where Atlanta is right now? Yeah, headline for me is the Road Warriors come home, right? I I think you got to count the Jet game, which was in London, albeit it was a home game for Atlanta. You're playing in London. That's not a home game. So you played on the road. (laughs) You've won three home games. Can you bring that ability home? Road Warriors come home. As far as a heat check goes, I think that, yeah, you can give them a little bit of a heat check, especially Kyle Pitts. He definitely deserves a heat check. He's he's hit some from downtown (laughs) in the last two times he's hit the field. So I think there's a little bit of something going on. It probably alludes to what Shock's talking about from a culture perspective. Can you finish games? You're two and two in that category. So we'll kind of see how that plays out. So warming up a little bit might be the temperature for the Atlanta Falcons. And I like your guys' headline. But you talked about Kyle Pitts. Let's dive into this discussion because another monster game from the rookie tight end. Seven catches, 163 yards. And he's starting to do the things that I think everybody saw on tape and everybody hoped that he would do once he got into an Atlanta Falcons uniform. Maybe it took a few weeks for him to get into it, Dave, but – Do the Falcons have one of those rare rookies on their team right now? Are we seeing one of these situations where maybe they did knock it out of the ballpark with Kyle Pitts? Maybe there were people questioning it early on, but right now he looks like the real deal. I talked to Matt Ryan about Kyle post game of this game, and obviously he's been really good the last two times out. 
uh, and really has been pretty good when you put him up to bat if you look at it through the first six weeks of the season. But he said the thing that he pointed out was not his ability to catch the ball in traffic, which we've seen, take a shot, show the emotion, which we saw after that last catch. Remember the catch over Xavier Howard to set you in field goal range at the end? He said it's his, it's his competitiveness. He said he's one of the most competitive dudes he's ever been around. That bodes well because that carries, right? That, that's yeah. lasting yes. if you're, you're, you're one of those kind of guys. I don't think there's any question. He's one of those rare rookie-type players that I think that he's only going to get better. And let's put in perspective the first few weeks to the last few weeks. This is a guy, remember, that they needed to affect the game in a lot of areas. And I'm talking about wherever you lined him up. Outside the numbers, slot, off the line of scrimmage tight, on the line of scrimmage tight. We all played the game. Those are all different positions. Yeah. And they, a lot of times, X, Z, Y, H, wherever you're lining up. Oh, by the way, there's pre-snap movement. I got to understand, does that shift what I am? Shift, shift the strength of a play. Do I take on something else when I shift from one side to the other? And then there's the chance that Matt Ryan changes the play at the line of scrimmage. This guy, I've talked about it for weeks. He's been drinking through a fire hose to absorb this offense. In the last two games, you've seen the waters calm, and now he's playing football because he knows where he's supposed to be. He knows the adjustments, and he's making plays, and I think that's what you're going to get. And, Arch, you mentioned that you talked to Matt, and it seemed, and I'm sure that early on in the season, Matt was saying, yes, I've got this weapon on my hands, but I've also got Calvin Ridley, and let's try to find a way to get the ball in the hands of Kyle Pitts. But now, DJ, it seems like Matt has got that connection, and he's saying, all right, I almost got to look for the big fella first because – it seems like nine and a half times out of ten, wherever he lines up on the field, DJ, he's creating a matchup, and now he's winning those matchups. And that's the number one thing you want as a quarterback, a guy that you can trust, that you can put up the bat, like Arch just mentioned, at any point. And regardless of sometimes as quarterbacks, we look out there and say, okay, we got our guy, but he also he's going against this guy. Or he's going against a guy who plays this route really well. Well, right now it looks like, he don't care who out there. He know he got number eight out there, and that's all that matters. And whenever you get a chance to have a guy like that, the trust level goes through the roof for a quarterback, and it gives you those opportunities where at any time in the game, if you need a play, he can be the guy that makes it for you. And I just want to add on to something that Arsh just mentioned, and I don't think fans can understand or realize how important what he just mentioned about the many spots that he can line up in. This is a rookie. This is not a guy that's been around the league like Matt Ryan has played in, you know, eight, nine different systems. This is his first time in the National Football League trying to understand what this game is like on this level, what the players are like, but also how to acclimate himself into this offense. And he's doing all this by being thrown at him all the different ways that they can get him the football. And that's tough to do. So this guy's not only talented enough to get it done, but mentally he has the wherewithal to – to, to understand in game what needs to be and where, where it needs to be at. So it's fun to be able to watch this guy. And he's a unique, unique player because there's not many guys as rookies. Uh, I don't know if you guys are in that boat, but come in as a rookie and be able to do the things that he's doing and be in multiple spots the way he's doing it and playing at a high level. So uh, Kyle Pitts is absolutely what you wanted when you drafted him at number four overall. And get ready, guys, because what he's done the last two times out I'm a defensive coordinator in Carolina this week. I said, ooh, I need to kind of rethink what I'm doing because he's going to – and now because of what we just talked about, his ability to line up in different places, how do I get this guy defended? Who's going to cover him? Shock, talk about matchup problem. It doesn't matter who's on him. Now as a defender, it does for me as a defensive coordinator, how do I roll coverage to him if he's outside wide? How do I bracket him in the slot? And all of a sudden, number 18 saying, <laughs> yeah. hey, I can get open. Number 14 says, I, <laughs> right. it, it, it accentuates what other guys are going to be able to do. So all of a sudden, the rookie can affect what defenses are doing almost already out of the start. Yeah, and it's almost like now Matt's going to start looking at the safeties and be like, okay, Kyle's over here. This safety's shaded this way. Boom, I'm going back over here. Yeah. Oh, you're going to play in the middle of the field? We're going back to the big fella. So we talked about unique. We talked about mismatches. And it start, It got me to think, guys, and let's, let's kind of talk about some – some rookies that we've seen in the past. And I'm going to start here because I've got kind of an interesting uh, setup here, and you guys will understand. But And this is high praise, but we're going to talk about some impactful rookies. I remember a guy in 1998 that came out. He didn't play for the Falcons. He actually played for the Minnesota Vikings. And I was at the University of Minnesota at the time. And the Vikings brought in this guy named Randy Moss. 
And <laughs> the same type of things were being said. Mismatch nightmare. The guy can take the top of the defense. He's a big play, big play just waiting to happen. And what did he end up do? He dominated his rookie season all the way through the regular season into the playoffs and nearly got the Minnesota Vikings to the Super Bowl if it wasn't for the Atlanta Falcons. How about that? <laughs> and so that's kind of like – now, granted, I'm talking about two different positions, but – you want to talk about a rookie that basically took over his position, much like Kyle Pitts is doing, kind of reminds me a little bit about how Randy Moss, his first season went. Dave, can you think about an impactful rookie that either in the last 5, 10, 15 years or maybe even when you played? Yeah, it's going to be tough to narrow it down. Let me give a quick honorable mention to Tommy Nobis, the first Falcon, the first pick. Absolutely. 294 tackles his rookie year, guys, in 14 games. That's still the NFL record, and we're playing 17 yeah. games now this season. He averaged 21 tackles a game. Unbelievable. So, Average. quick mention, quick mention to Mr. Falcon, Tommy Nobis. A couple of guys came to mind. I was trying to throw which one around. One guy that I played against, Eric Dickerson, who came out his rookie mm. year, was rookie of the year. He had 1,800 yards and 18 touchdowns. Oh, by the way, he caught 51 passes for 500 yards wow. and two more touchdowns. And then he followed it in the 84 season. My rookie year was setting the NFL record with 2,100-yard rushing <laughs> the next season. <laughs> oh he had 32 rushing touchdowns in the first two years. Phenomenal. Another quick honorable mention. I know I'm taking probably for taking one of the shocks, but Devin Hester <laughs> yes. came out of, yeah. out of Miami, and nobody knew where he was going to play. Receiver, DB, well, we knew where he was going to play. He was going to return to yes. shock. <laughs> he had, or uh, you guys, he had seven returns for touchdowns his rookie year in different capacities, three kickoff returns, three punt returns. He returned a missed field goal for a touchdown, yes. 106 yards for a touchdown. He had the opening kickoff he took back for a touchdown in the Super Bowl. Just a quick one to throw in there, Shock. Show. I knew I took more time, mm. much time than I was supposed to. Right Did he now. take all of yours, Shock? I mean, we know Arch breaks the rules. It's all good. I mean, <laughs> he's the veteran of our group, so we let Arch go. But, no, those are awesome dudes. I mean, I remember, obviously, Tommy Novus. Everybody knows him from uh, the Falcons and what he's about. But 21 tackles a game is unfreaking real. Uh, but I, I remember watching Hess for a long time. And uh, you as well, Rack. I mean, freaking Randy Moss. I mean, what quarterback didn't want to throw to him back in the day? You Jump just knew ball. that was an automatic <laughs> six. Uh, for me, though, man, I'm going to go with a similar guy, uh, a running back that is comparable to what Arch just talked about. Maybe not, but maybe so. But then also a guy from that Minnesota Vikings wing. You guys know I'm from the Big 12. Come on, Oklahoma guy, <laughs> Adrian Peterson. Yeah. I, I mean, come on, this dude came into the NFL. You thought this dude was freaking untackleable, if that's even a word. But this dude could not be tackled. I mean, I remember one game he had 296 yards in one freaking game, rushed for over 1,300 yards, uh, 13 TDs in 14 games. And you just knew this game, this dude was going to be a game record from the beginning. So I remember watching Adrian Peterson like, I'm so glad I have no responsibilities on the <laughs> defensive side of the ball because this dude ran with a reckless abandon. You just remember knees all in people's face, running through guys, and he's going to run by you. I mean, he was literally uh, Derrick Henry before Derrick Henry with that size. Shock, we, if you remember, we opened the season against Minnesota yes. in Minnesota, Adrian Peterson's <laughs> yeah. rookie year. And the yes. first time they touched the ball, he threw a swing pass. He went 65 for a touchdown. Yeah. Yeah, that I mean, yeah. phenomenal player. No yeah, I mean we've we've talked about some guys. I know we're kind of putting Kyle Pitts in a, in a conversation that maybe is unfair to him, but I think it's all high praise from us because sure. we see all of the athletic talent and we see the big playability, the mismatches that he creates. So maybe, just maybe, maybe. the Falcons have this type of player on their hands, and maybe that'll say something about the rest of the season. Speaking of the rest of the season, we want to talk about. Whether and, and people will debate this clutch thing, right? Like, is clutch actually even a thing, or is it just what pros do? They go out and compete. But the way that the Falcons have closed out a few of the games the last few weeks, I just want to see where you guys feel now, where we talked earlier in the season finishing was an issue. Have they started to answer some of those questions for you, Arch, that they are in a better position now to close out games? I think we always knew Matt Ryan was that guy, right? This was his 40th career come from behind or tie to take your team to a win. I mean, think about that just in itself. Matt Ryan's done it 40 times, right. bring you back in the fourth quarter or overtime to win a football game. I think there's a degree of it there. But as soon as we say one team is clutched, they'll say the other team choked. It. Right. It's just a matter of what angle you're looking <laughs> right. at it, right? <laughs> What, yeah, I, look, what sure. I look like in this game is, to me, 
the Tampa game was there for the taking and you let it get away from you through the ball to the other team, tips, whatever you want to call. Tampa, you closed the cushion, what was 29-26 in the fourth quarter, you had a chance and it got away from you. Same thing happened to you in the Washington game. I mean, uh, Arthur Smith has been very transparent about the fact he didn't call that last offensive series the right way and it allowed Washington to win the game at the end. But you also have the two, the, the win this weekend against Miami and the win in New York against the Giants where you did close the game out. Yep. So I think you're two and two and you're semi-clutch. Yeah, and, and Arch, you <laughs> talked a little bit about Matt Ryan and I think that's kind of a proven commodity, if you will. But DJ, and I don't want to I don't want to lead you a certain direction, but Young Way Koo was not necessarily a proven commodity as far as closing games out. But now we're starting to see that this young kicker is not only deadly accurate, but it seems like he's got ice in his veins because the moment did not look like it was too big for him at all. He drills another kick to win the game for Atlanta. Rack, I'll be honest, man. Uh, there's times where you know a kicker's about to come onto the field and you get extremely nervous. <laughs> or you say, man, this is maybe a little bit out of his range. <laughs> or he hasn't really been good from the right hash. But when Young Way Koo comes to the field, there's no nervousness for me. I feel like this guy has been so clutch and so what you call a guarantee almost when you get to a certain spot on the field. You cross that 50, you almost got to tell your quarterback, all right, look, we know we got three in the back. Let's make sure we do everything. To, we're trying to score points. We're trying to score touchdowns. But we know young Wei Koo's going to come through for us. And what – I mean, he's done that since he's been the guy. So there's nothing to tell you that young Wei Koo can't get it done or you should be worrying about once you get across the 50 that you're going to worry about uh, your kicker because we've seen around the National Football League where teams have had issues closing games out with their kicker. And we don't have that issue. He's become the stalemate for us. He's become a veteran. Uh, on that third phase, and we know if we give him opportunity, he gonna smack it through the uprights. Yeah, I know. We're we're it's I'm like trying, trying to not to jinx some, some things. Yeah. Right? He just, I hope he just didn't do the broadcast or curse <laughs> on him. No, actually, well, I think... that's only if we're calling the game, aren't I mean, this is afterthought. <laughs> You know, uh, during the game, they actually lit. did mention that on the television <laughs> version. They 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 threw out what could have been the broadcaster jinx, but yeah. then Young Way Koo ended up nailing it. And maybe maybe if things progress like this, he'll end up nailing a couple of kicks to get the Falcons into the postseason. Mm -hmm. This episode, in part, brought to you by the Home Depot. There are officially no more excuses about why you can't get your bathroom fixed or why you can't build a deck in the backyard. Not sure where to start? No problem. Everything you need for your next home improvement project is just a tap away on the Home Depot app. Their digital toolbox gives you access to how-to guides, project calculators, image search, so you'll always know exactly what you need to pick up. Don't have the tools you need? Rent items from drills, blowers, carpet cleaners, generators, and more. Big or small, indoor or out, the Home Depot has the equipment you need. With the tap of a finger, you can reserve equipment ahead of time, swing by, and pick it up and get started. Ready to invest in your own tools? Browse through millions of items from top brands you can have delivered right to your door. Whatever your project, find exactly what you need with the Home Depot app. Download the Home Depot app today. So, DJ, let me start with you. Three and three, still early on in the season. And maybe I don't want to overuse the term. We talked a little bit about temperature earlier on in this podcast, but I'll just ask you, how is your temperature for the Falcons going to the postseason on what you have seen to this point? You know what? I'm still uh, – I'm going to be honest. I'm still on the fence because – to be a good team that makes it into the postseason, you got to win at home. And we've seen them do it on the road, but you have to win the ball games in your own building, and that matters. Um, I remember when I was playing, we always talked about you got to win at home and split it on the road. And if this team can do that, that puts you at 11 wins. If you're able to win on the win at home and then split half your games on the road, you got a great chance of being there at the end. And that puts a lot of pressure on a lot of other teams in the NFC because – you're doing a good job of doing what you're supposed to, which is winning at home and making it hard when people come to Mercedes-Benz Stadium. So the playoff part of it, yeah, we can look forward. Uh, the team will never do that. But when you look forward and you look at some of the games that's coming, um, the games at the games at home, you got obviously you got the Panthers, you got the Pats, Bucks, Lions, and Saints. Well, you look at three out of four of those are versus division opponents, and you know how big division opponents are. If you win your games in your division, that puts you in a great position 
to make it to the playoffs. So obviously those games are amplified, and then we go to the NFC, and then you go to splitting on the road where, you know, you got some tough games with the Cowboys, the Saints, but you got a Jags team that you got to go on the road to that, you know, won one game. You feel good about, hey, you get an opportunity to go in there, you get a chance to play. And then Panthers, 49ers, and Bills. I mean, 49ers, you know, they've had their struggles. We just saw them the other night. The Colts took them to the woodshed. So anything can happen on any given night, of course. But I just feel as though if you can win the games that you're supposed to win, which is at home, which is one of the, the places where you should feel as though teams should not be able to come to your building and win and then split on the road, you got a great chance of pushing. But it all starts within your division. And obviously, we got a division game this weekend, and that's what matters. Dave, I'm usually not the guy that likes to talk about playoffs this early in the season, but I understand it's something the fa- the fans like to do. But since the NFL made the change, so one extra team now getting into the postseason, I, w- I went back and I looked at it, and they're actually sitting one position out of the playoff race if there's such a thing right now is a playoff race. I think the Minnesota Vikings might be the team ahead of them right now, but they're the first team out, if you will. So what has to happen for them to find themselves in the postseason? Because you got Tampa Bay, looks like they're in just in full control mm-hmm. of the division right now. Well, the ship sailed on trying to win every game at home, right? We've already lost two at home. So I guess we could go win all of them on the road, Jock. <laughs> we could go, we could flip the script and win all the road games and split our home games and we'd have a chance to be in. Right. Uh, I, Shockley's, uh, Shock's right. There's no question. You've got you've to gotta solidify your own building. You've let a couple get off, get away from you. Doesn't mean you can't win the last six games at home and take care of that piece of it. Actually, five games at home because one of your road, your one of your road wins is actually a home win. Yeah, figure that one out. But uh, so you do have to take care <laughs> of that. Uh, the division is not gone. I, I know Tampa is out there. What five and one, six yeah. and whatever there. So Atlanta's a couple games behind Tampa. You get Tampa coming here. Tampa's got to come here. I don't think they are unbeatable. They certainly have played well. I mean, the Rams proved they're not they're 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 beatable. Certainly, right? So, but you worry about that bridge when you cross right, it. You got to right. take care of the division game in in your own building. Carolina coming up next. I think it's certainly feasible, uh, Rack. When you look at at the expansion of the postseason, um, you begin to glance around the NFC. Boy, the Rams playing well. Cardinals are playing extremely well. They're out to a 7-0 and start. You look up north, and Green Bay's playing pretty solidly. Chicago's kind of middle of the road a little bit, right? So you're, you're not, you know, there. And, and then you look you look at the east. You've won one against the east, and you've lost one against the east. So you got, you got one coming up against the Cowboys. So it's all right there in front of you. So I think people, everybody got kind of upset. You're 0-2, and, and you don't look good. And now all of a sudden you've won three of your last four. And then you kind of say, okay, well, wait a minute. Maybe things are starting to steady here a little bit. And you look up and you say, we're still in the mix. Yeah, and it's it's one of those situations where you have, in the NFC, your division leaders have proven themselves. But outside of that, it seems like everybody's almost kind of in the same mm-hmm. situation, which I think that bodes well for Atlanta. Again, a lot of season left here. Mm-hmm. A lot of things can happen. Uh, teams get on win- winning streaks, losing streaks. But sitting just one spot out of the playoffs right now is not necessarily a bad position. You guys talked about got to be able to win your division games. You, we, we mentioned it. Carolina coming up this weekend. Dave, I want to ask you, Halloween matchup, the digital media departments like to have some fun with each other. It's a good little rivalry that goes on between these two teams. But between the lines, what does Atlanta have to do to get this divisional win this weekend? It's a big one, and it's a game without Christian McCaffrey. You'd like to think the Falcons have a good chance of winning. Well, I think that – it's, it's going to be similar to what we one of the one of my keys to the Miami game is you're going to have to tackle well on defense because you knew they're going to throw the ball short. They had guys that could catch the football, make things happen. Waddle was a problem. Gasicki, the tight end, was a problem. Certainly, Miles Gaskin coming out of the back. It's a similar situation with this team. This team has got guys that are good run after the catch players. I think you're going to have to you're going to have to tackle extremely well. Now they've got a bit of a quarterback thing going on. Up yeah. There. Sam Darnold got yeah. pulled out of the game. DJ Walker came in. He, he didn't really do anything either. So Matt Rule's got a decision to make there. I would assume Darnold will get the start, but how quickly is the hook? Uh, so you're going to have to prepare now. Talk to Arthur Smith on his coach's show for the radio, and he said, yeah, we're going to have to kind of look at both quarterbacks, which one, what do they, what difference do they bring to the table and kind of have to prepare for Sue. So that's a bit of a problem for Dean Pease's side of the football. On the other side, you got to protect the passer. This is a group that's got some young guys that can come after the quarterback. I think you can destroy their back end, yeah. but you got to be able to give Ryan time to throw it. 
I think Matt's in a really good spot right now, guys. I think he's been pretty surgical the last two times out, getting the football to Pitts, getting the ball to different guys. Um, so I, I think that he's in a good place. Can you keep that going? And part of that means, okay, to keep the quarterback standing there so he can sling it. Yeah. DJ, from what you've seen, kind of kind of building off of what Arch is talking about, if you're Matt Ryan, are you licking your lips for this matchup for some of the guys that you got the the Ridleys and the Pittses and what he, what's happened in the last couple of weeks has given him a lot of confidence that he can take apart this defense offensively. Yeah, no doubt, Rack. And I, I think you go back to this last ball game, and I think going into – Halftime, Matt hit eight different receivers in the game. And that just talks about him spreading the football around. That tells you he has confidence in whoever's on the field with him. And, I mean, you go back to a few weeks back when uh, he didn't have his top two guys in London, and he still threw the ball full of 300 yards and played pretty well. Matt Ryan is a guy, regardless of who's on the field with him, he's going to make those guys better. And I love the fact that they're starting to distribute the football to a lot of different guys on the field, make, allowing all these guys to have an integral part of the success of this offense. And – uh, for me, I still want to see more out of the run game. I know there's times where, hey, we hit the run game when we needed to. Uh, there were runs that we hit when, uh, obviously, you, you know, you wanted to pick up some yards. Um, but as we know, coming into this system, this was a system predicated on the play-action game. And we're still, you know, in a process of working that out. But the success you still had without it tells you volumes about the guy that's, you know, running the show in Matt Ryan, but also in the way that they're creating some down the field plays for uh, this offensive staff. So I, I'm excited to watch him and continue to go forward. But I think Matt has done a really good job of keeping everybody into the ball. And I heard, um, you know, Arch talking about it in the pregame show going, leading up to the game is Matt's done such a great job of being the leader. And uh, Arch, you mentioned it. He said that, you know, Matt will be walking down the hallway and he'll just be, you know, pegging guys with questions. He continue to keep guys on their toes. He's asking them about, you know, what happens on this particular down, what happens in the red zone. And that kind of stuff is being because guys are forced to know that, hey, my guy at any given time is going to ask me a question. I got to know what's going on. So then when you get in the game, things are so much easier. Uh, so I love the fact even in his 14th year, Matt is still finding ways to get the most out of the guys around him because he knows his success is absolutely dependent upon those dudes. You got rookies ducking in a closet. So here comes Ryan. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Jump in a closet. And the funny He's part is, is, is I start thinking about some of the guys that probably would have just, like, given him something back. Like, I ain't answered your question. Or they would have – like, Brian Finner would have been like, yeah, right, I ain't asking that right now. Hey, real quick, real quickly, Shock makes a good point about the run game, and there's a lot predicated offensively on the run game. I will say, guys, they did not run the ball very well in this game at all. But when they had to – and this is a young offensive line, and we all – you know how you go – your 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 feeling about what you are goes up exponentially as a young player. As, a, as, a, as an older player, it kind of goes up gradually, right, or, or increases a little bit as, as you get in the league. This is a young offensive line. They had to pound out a, a first down and eat up Miami's, Miami's timeouts after the Kyle Pitts unbelievable grab. They're yep. in field goal range, right? Yep. yep. But if you, you kneel down on the ball right there three times or you get three one-yard runs – they burn their timeouts. Tua's got the ball back in his hands with only needing a field goal to win the football game. Yeah. They had to go get a first down, and Miami knew it, and they still pounded out 10 yards on the ground in three run plays. That's got to bode for something, guys. That's yes. got to be something you put in your pocket as an offensive line that I'm carrying forward with me. Yeah, we talked a lot effort. about Matt Ryan and Young Way Koo, but the offensive line doing what they got to do to help close out the game. One last topic that I want to talk about. We can make this short and sweet here, Arch, but – NFL trade deadline, not not as big of a deal as it is in other sports, but it's next week. And team in our division, you just mentioned it, Carolina Panthers and Sam Darnold mm. having some issues. They have surfaced as a potential trade partner with the Houston Texans for Deshaun Watson. So my question is, do the Panthers trade and bring Deshaun Watson over to take over for Sam Darnold? What do you, when's he going to play? Is he going to play? You don't even <laughs> right. know if he's going to play yeah. for you. And then are you willing to take on the fallout with potentially that comes what's going to go along with it? There's a lot of baggage here. What am I giving up as far as a draft pick? Those are three questions I need the answers to. Yeah. There's no doubting what Deshaun Watson is as a player, but there's a lot else that goes along with it. They gave up a two, a four, and a six to get Sam Darnold, DJ. Do you think they got any more draft picks or something that they could send over for to Houston for Deshaun Watson? Man, it's unbelievable. And then the last question that, that you got to ask is, the Houston is given no guarantees on what happens once he's traded. Like, okay, if he comes over and then obviously he can't play, well, they're like, well, 
He's off our books, so we ain't got to worry about him. So there's a bunch of questions that go along with I'm with Arch on that. Obviously, you would love to have a, a talent like Deshaun watch on your team, but guess when is he going to get between the white lines? You just <laughs> do not know. So I, I'm not sure if you can pull that trigger not knowing what your future could be if you get this guy on your squad. Well, we could sit here and we can talk about all the different options, but unless you're in the four walls of those personnel buildings <laughs> up there and you're on the telephone with the conversations that we're, they're having – we're never going to know. All right, that's going to wrap it up for this edition of the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. By the way, thanks so much for joining us on AtlantaFalcons.com, Spotify, YouTube, all the different areas that you look for your podcast. We appreciate you joining us. We're going to let this guy go. He's going to go uh, hit BP with Jorge Soler, or maybe he already did, uh, but he did get a ball. I thought that was Jose Soler. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, DJ, enjoy the game tonight, man. Hopefully, uh, for Atlanta's sake that are watching, you're going to be covering Atlanta Braves game one win. But otherwise, uh, we appreciate everything, man, and we'll hopefully we'll see you in studio here next week. Thanks, fellas. Appreciate it, man. Y'all enjoy. I'm going to see these Braves. Go get game one win, <laughs> Go baby. Braves! Yeah, don't call it great job, Arch. We'll be back here next week for another edition of uh, the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. Have a great week, everybody. <laughs>